the voice. Good morning. We're so good to be with you. It's good to see your faces. We have so many fun things happening this week. Fern, can you tell them what's going on this week? Yeah. Monday night virtual Bible study, 7 p.m. on Zoom, covering the book of Genesis. Tuesday, Teresa Fair, 12 to 2 on Zoom. Every Woman's Battle, Tuesday, 7 o'clock on Zoom. Tuesday, 8 p.m., Men's Group, Image Bearers on Zoom. Wednesday, New Time Prayer, 12 to 2 on Zoom. Thursday night, virtual Bible study on Zoom, 7 p.m., covering the book of James. So those are all the fun things going on this week. Really want to encourage you, if you haven't yet, sign up for our new Bible study on Monday nights. We still have the Thursday night Bible study. So Monday nights, book of Genesis. Thursday nights, going through the book of James still. We have some new things that we're going to start trying to do on our Zoom calls. So this Sunday, starting right after this message, we are going to have a meet and greet. And we're going to put you in Zoom rooms and basically get time together before the message. And then we're going to go back at the end of the message and gather back in Zoom rooms as a time of really connecting, discussing what was, what was spoken about, and really seeing and connecting with one another. How does that sound, Fern? Good. I want to go in a Zoom room too. Me too. Oh, Fun. perhaps we'll have a Zoom room for children as well. So hope we hope you'll join us for that. And thanks again. Have a great Sunday. Bye. 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 Everybody like my picture and so fast. morning, Life Center. It's so good to see you guys. Um, we're just going to prepare our hearts to, for... Um, forgiving worship. I was going to say worship, and it is an act of worship. Um, and you're going to have a little um, link in your chat box to give, so that should be coming up soon. Today I want to read from Genesis 7, going back to Noah. I've been in a theme of Noah, and I want to just share something about giving that really hit me about Noah. So first it says in um, Genesis 7, verse 2, take with you seven pairs of any kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, one pair of every kind of unclean animal, and a male and its mate. And then I'm gonna skip over to when Noah gets out of the ark and what he does first. So in verse uh, chapter eight, verse 20, it says, then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. And the crazy thing is, when I was studying these chapters, it said, um, one of the commentaries said, you know, Noah, when he gave some of the animals, he basically was on the border, he could have extinct a whole animal population. 
And, and that just hit me so tremendously, like his desire to give, even when it was so costly and it could extinct X, Y, and Z. Um, and his heart for um, just the goodness of God. I just feel like his eyes were so hit on the goodness of God that he didn't care. And, and isn't that what we see in the Bible, these costly gifts that we give, that it doesn't matter, we can waste it all. We know God is good and he is better and he is worth it and we can fully trust that um, he has it. He has it all and he's worth it. So I just want to pray over our offering today that God, we will be so focused on your goodness that even if it is costly and even to where Noah, he could have extinct a whole population. He said that was not worth it. That you, God, are worth giving all the glory, giving everything to. So, Father, I pray for each person um, that's here joining us. We just bless what they have to give. We thank you, Father, that you take care of all of our needs, and we extravagantly pour out our offerings and our gifts to you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. And now I have the opportunity to just... Um, introduce Pastor Bill, who today is going to be having a conversation with Jamal and Yannick on race. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. It's so good to be with you, Life Center. Um, I just heard on our drive-in today that we're moving to phase four in New York City, so um, hopefully we'll be able to start gathering in person uh, in the near future. We're Stay tuned, we're working out those details, but uh, we're just so excited that, you know, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, we're coming out of this, God's being glorified in, in, in all that's going on, so yeah, bless the Lord. So I am looking forward to this, uh, to this conversation today. We're, we're just in, entitling this message, A Conversation on Race. I'm here with my good, good friends, brothers, uh, Jamal Holly, Yannick Wood, members of our congregation for a long time. And, you know, we've just been friends and uh, walking with God together. And, and that's uh, the beauty of this is that we can have an honest conversation. Uh, I, and before we start this conversation, I, I wanted to lay a, a scriptural foundation for, for an understanding. I think there's, there's a lot of uh, confusion. There's misunderstanding and a lot of accusation that, that happens in the midst of these conversations. And we don't want to align with any of that. The Bible says where there's confusion, there's every evil work. We know that the enemy acts as the accuser of the brethren. Um, but God's throne room, his, his very throne, it says in, uh, in, in the Psalms, uh, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne, O God. Mercy and truth go before your face. So the very throne room of God is, is based on righteousness and justice, mercy and truth. Uh, and before we can you know, move to rec racial reconciliation, which I hear a lot of people talking about and I'm all for, you know, there has to be an acknowledgement of truth. There has to be an understanding of, of, uh, of what's happened an acknowledgement, and then we can then then it makes it easier to move forward. You can't heal a wound by just covering over an infected area and just and and expect it to be okay. You have to clean out the wound first, and then you can allow healing to occur. Uh, and so let's just turn to Proverbs chapter one, because I feel like we need the wisdom of God in this time. And it's beginning of chapter one, verse one, it says, "The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David." king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning. I just want to pause there. That's what we're trying to do today. We're trying to hear. I, I, I ask everyone to put on hold all of your, all the narratives and, and prejudgments that we make in society, our worldviews. I, I, I want to tell you that I, I come to the table today very much as like sort of a conservative evangelical background. That's, 
that's been my approach. But I also have come to understand that there are things that I didn't know before. And I'm trying to learn. I want to listen and hear and understand. And it's only when we start to learn, listen, and understand that we can start to move toward healing. A man of understanding will attain wise counsel to understand the proverb and an enigma. I feel like this is an enigma. This whole situation uh, of, our, of race relations in the U.S. is an enigma. But God has an answer. The words of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Let us not be foolish. Let's hear. Let's listen. Let's learn together. Um, in Micah, it says, he has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of, of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. So... I come today wanting to take a posture of humility and understand, and I, I, I feel like I, I have been humbled. I've been humbled in, in this process and this journey of saying, you know, I didn't realize certain things had happened through history, you know. You know, sometimes we look back and we say, oh, well, we fought the Civil War. There was the 13th Amendment. That ended all of it. No, it didn't. Then you say, well, there's this Civil Rights uh, Act of 64. That ended all of discrimination. No, it didn't. And so we have to look back and understand what were some of the underpinnings, the foundations, and, and the experience. So we're going to start out with just even just trying to understand what is racism? Uh, what is it? Where is it? How have we experienced it? And uh, with that, I'm going to turn to Yannick. And uh, Yannick, would you just share from your experience and, you know, you know just share your just heart? Just share your heart. Okay. Um well, good morning, everyone, um, and thank you, Pastor Bill, for having me. Um, and this is a great conversation. Um, I actually did want to start with um, talking about race just in general, and I do want to bring in some scripture as well. Um, so race just in general is a North American construct that um, it was something that was created hundreds of years ago, just the idea of race. Uh, prior to the idea of race, it was um, ethnicity. In the Bible, they talk about ethnos. Um, and uh, um, what we might think of, you know, white or black, um, you know, people think Africa might be the black continent, right? But Africa should really be looked at as tens of thousands of different ethnic groups right. um, who have different cultures, different languages. So it's not just black, right? you know? But in North America, they created this, um, this uh, caste system, this hierarchy where um, you know, there's people who have certain features that make them black, people who have certain features that make them white, and um, certain races are higher than other races. And they created this system in order to justify slavery. Uh, basically, uh, America was agricultural, and they had all these crops, tobacco, and cotton that they wanted to have wow. harvested. And um, in order to do that with free labor, they had to create some sort of hierarchy. Well, uh, you know, Yannick, even as you say that, I'm just thinking of the, you know, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, but who is my neighbor? Yeah. And then Jesus gives the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And, you know, it was uh, the Samaritan man who took care of the... Of the uh, abused or beat up or mugged, however you refer to the, the, the Jewish person. And, and he says, go and do likewise. Um, so this idea of redefining, you know, what, well, who is my neighbor? You know, I think even in America with our founding documents saying, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. But then we try to define men and, 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 and play into that narrative. So it's, it's just important we understand that. Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Oh, no problem. And, and, and just to show you just an example of how fluid race is, uh, race is um, there was a time where Irish Americans were considered black. Right. But I mean, well, you know, so, um, uh, but, but after a period of time, they were uh, brought back into the, into the fold, I guess, of, of, yeah. of being white. 
Right. Um, so that just shows you how fluid it really is. Um, so th the reason why I mentioned that is just, um, I just wanted to lay the foundation because I'm going to go to James uh, chapter 5, verse 4. And um, uh, that's in the New American Standard Version. Uh, it, it states, uh, Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. So, so th this is a very interesting verse. Um, and I'll, I'll just do a little sh shameless plug. You, we, we read this in, my, my, um, in the Bible study. So... Um, uh, James is just a really, really good book for, for um, handling these types of issues. But uh, the Bible is talking about a system like slavery. Um, it talks about the cries of, of, um, of uh, workers going up to, to God. Um, and historic injustices are not forgotten by God. Wow. Wow. Um, in fact... It, it, represents, it represents a stronghold, uh, almost like a memorial to God. And God has just not forgotten it. And as a country, we haven't dealt with these issues. So now uh, we're actually dealing with them now um, when they should have actually been dealt with later. Um, and it, I just think it's interesting because it's kind of like um, in Acts 10, they talk about Cornelius. And Cornelius was, I, I just want to read because I want to make sure it's, I'm getting this precise. Um, so he was a Roman centurion whose prayers, the Bible states, his prayers and alms rose up to God as a memorial. So in the same way that the robbery of certain individuals, of their talents, of their skills, um, couldn't rise up to God and be a memorial, the same way with our prayers and our alms, that could rise up to God as a memorial. Um, I'll just go to a Luke, Luke uh, chapter 11, verse 42. Uh, again, New American Standard. Um, it says, woe to you Pharisees, you pay tithes of mint, rue, and every herb, and neglect justice. So as a church, we just need to make sure that, um, you know, we do church things, yes, but we, make sure, we need to make sure that we do not neglect justice. Amen. So um, as Christians, we, we, we just need to make sure that we live in a world where if one part of the body is suffering, um, that... We just need to not ignore that. And, and that's just a, a, a big thing about um, what, what's going on over here. Yeah, I mean, that's the, if the foundation of his throne is righteousness and justice, how can we, how can we ignore justice? You know, it, it's, it's foundational. Yeah, so good. Um, I just have a, f a few more things, and then, sure. um, and then maybe I can talk about some um, in the individual you know, things. Um, also, later on in Luke uh, eleven forty-seven, 47, going into 48, J this is Jesus talking. He says, woe to you, he's talking to the Pharisees, uh, because you build tombs, or in other translations it says monuments, for the prophets, and it was your own ancestors who killed them long ago. So you stand as witnesses who agree with what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets, and you build their tombs. So... In this verse, and then also other verses, the Bible establishes that we are responsible for what our ancestors have done. So it's not enough to just say, oh, well, that happened in the past, and I'm not like them. I haven't done anything as bad as them now. Uh, it's not enough to say that. We, we are responsible. And, and later on, we're going to have a conversation about how um, we each play a part in this system of, of racism and um, through our actions or through the things that we do not do. So our commissions or, or our omissions, things where we have an opportunity to say something and we don't say something. Um, and, and, and that's just a very important thing, you know, yeah. when... Yeah. You know, it, it occurs to me, like, part of, you know, there's an, an American cultural, whether it's a myth or not, whatever, there is a thing about rugged individualism, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. So we tend to want to disassociate from the sins of the past and say, well, that's not me, I'm not like that, you know, whatever. But there has to be a reckoning with what happened in the past uh, in order for true healing to be. We can't just say, that wasn't me, that was someone else. And there is a culture that, you know, of, of this rugged individualism that, that 
inf that sort of push pushes us. I don't know if it pushes us or how how to say it, but we do disassociate with the sins of the past and say, well, that wasn't me. I didn't do that. I'm not responsible. But Daniel, when he saw, when he recognized in the captivity in Babylon, uh, and he started to cry out to God for the deliverance of Israel, he confessed his sin and the sins of his, of his you know, fathers, the forefathers, uh, and asking God for, for, for deliverance and reminding God of his promises. He never disassociated. And so that's a scriptural concept. Yeah, I just wanted, I just to, wanted to, to point, to that, point out. that out. Amen. Um, so just with me personally, um, I, um, how, how I personally have agreed with the stronghold of racism is um, when I um, felt inferior based on my color, based on what my hair was like, uh, based on uh, perhaps how I spoke or, um, and, and, this, and, and this, this happened because of uh, interactions that I had with people who were around me be it coworkers or classmates. Um, and, you know, like I said, we all have, we all play a part in this. So when I agree with the lie that's told to me through the media, through people um, saying these things, that's agreeing with the spirit, that's agreeing with the stronghold of racism. Um, you know, people might have had, com uh, uh, people, actually, you know, when growing up, people said, uh, like, oh, Yannick, you're, you're not black, or, um, or, or you're good, how, how, how could you, you, know, you, you know, like you're not like those other, other people, you know, people would say things like that, or, or can I touch your hair, or they would make me the other, things like that. Or, um, you know, this came up in my, my, my office, you know, I, I work in, 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 in law enforcement, I work in a, a prosecutor's office, and uh, they once asked me to be a part of a lineup. Um, so a lineup is when uh, somebody is accused of committing a crime, and then they have other individuals who they're supposed to look like them. Um, but um, in, in this situation, um, there was nothing about me being a prosecutor, being a lawyer for several years with this coworker uh, that made her think maybe she should hesitate before asking me that. And um, uh, she asked other people to be in lineups, and I actually got to see what the lineups looked like, and they, the people who she asked did not look like anybody who was in the lineup. So. It was really just because I'm black made me look like this criminal or this person who's accused of a crime. Right. Um, and then just even several months ago, this just happened like where, where I live, uh, and I was in the Walgreens, you know, I was uh, picking up uh, some sort of prescription, and uh, there was a lady who accused me of stealing her cell phone. Mm. And um, uh, the cashier apologized to me, and she said that she's actually been accusing several people of stealing her cell phone. And then I was, it was drawn to my attention that there was a black man who was walking out of the store who she just accused. And it was a 40 or 50 year old like, black man who, not, not me, <laughs> doesn't look like me, doesn't look anything like that. But she was going from one person to the next person accusing them and they just happened to be black people. And uh, you know, I'm a prosecutor, I, I walk around with my badge around uh, just in case, you know, these, this precise thing. But if I didn't have that, then what, what could have my uh, interaction with law enforcement have been? Right. So, I mean, these things, these things are real. Um, and I just one last thing I just want to mention is that um, a lot of times we think racism um, is people who have sheets on their heads or who um, have, a, have a gun, you know, or who are chasing people in pickup trucks. And, and um, most racism does not involve violence. Most racism uh, involves these very slight interactions, this very slight belittling of one person's race. Um, comments about what is good, what is bad, what is safe, what is unsafe. That is what racism looks like. And that could really mold what, how black people feel about themselves or how white people feel about themselves. Like we're all in this boat together and it, it really, it negatively impacts the church. Um, but I'm, I'm really happy we're having this conversation and I think that the fact that we have um, the same God that we pray to, the same Bible that we, we hold, um, and, 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 and all this, the scriptural support. I think the church is uniquely qualified to get this right because we all speak this language that we can understand, a language that goes to the heart. Racism is not a, a mind thing. It's a thing. heart thing. Yeah. And that's why, and that's I, why I, think I, I think this conversation is really important. Really yeah. important. Yeah. 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 You know, as we were talking earlier, I, I commented, I'm... Um, 
so glad that God has set us here in New York City in a very multicultural, diverse community of believers because we get to interact with one another and see that, that we really, really are all the same. Um, but often in monocultural settings, whether it's all white, all black, all Asian, uh, or, or, or Latino, you can fill in uh, the adjective that describes the group of people where it's a monocultural setting, the cultural biases and prejudices are simply reinforced. And, um, you know, I uh, was commenting that, you know, we're vacationing, you know, down uh, on the Jersey Shore and talking to some neighbors who live down there all year round. And, you know, just you can hear it in their language that they have no interaction with people of other races. And the things they say, they just like dismiss some obvious things like what happened to George Floyd. And then they focus on, you know, the things that happened to the police. And like it's almost one part of the narrative is like is, is zeroed out in their minds. And I, I think that can happen in a monocultural setting. Uh, so I, I, I'm so happy, you know. I'm grateful to God that he's placed us in a, in a multicultural setting. And I just pray for all those listening that, that may be in, in, in monocultural settings uh, that we, you try to hear and learn um, from others that, you know, um, you know truth is not uh, uh, exclusive to one ethnic background. We need to take truth and apply it across the board and understand and have an understanding. Jamal, I wanted to, to, to hear from you, the, you, you know, your experiences with racism. I, you know, a definition of racism is seeing someone as less valuable than yourself based on, you know, some outward genetic characteristic, whether it's skin pigmentation or whatever. If you see yourself as better or less than, then you're, you're, you're impacted by this racism. Like Yannick said at one point, he had to deal with some inferiority issues because of the cultural reinforcement that was was happening around him and uh, and that's that's buying into a lie which you we have to you know we know here that we, you know if we want to get healed we have to break our agreements with lies and uh, and that's where healing occurs because it's the truth that will make us free but Yana uh, Jamal can you share a little bit yes uh, <clears throat> excuse me thank you um, as well just for inviting me to be here um, it's uh, it's uh, it's humbling and, um, and and honored to do so um, and, and Yannick, I, I, I completely relate to, um, the experiences that you're talking about. And, you know, even, even this idea, and, and, and we've heard it over and over again from, uh, people of color where we're told at home that we have to work twice as hard in order to achieve the same thing. And, um, although it may be true, it just adds to that mindset that you're talking about that I am less than. Um, and, and, you know, and that's a language that we have to change in our households as well. Um, but I, I just wanted to talk about an, uh, an experience that I had growing up, um, growing up in Boston, uh, Massachusetts. Um, I was a part of this program called the METCO program. And really what it is, it's a, um, it's a voluntary uh, integrational, uh, you know, educational integration system that uh, they came out all around the country uh, pretty much after the Civil Rights Movement. And um, what it was is it bussed inner city kids out to suburban schools um, to get a better education. And um, I was privileged and fortunate enough to be a part of that program. And, um, and uh, I, I was a, a part of this program um, pretty much from the second grade up until um, 11th grade. So up until straight through high school. And one of the benefits of this program is you're able to build relationships with, um, with, uh, with children, uh, well, well, students um, from different neighborhoods around Boston who were bussed out with you, but also the people who lived in the community where we were going to school. And these are long-term relationships. I mean, I, I've known people from the second grade all the way up into high school, so you're talking 10 years of knowing each other. So, so these were inner city, Primarily um, black children being bused to suburban white neighborhoods. Correct. Okay. We we were we were everyone who was on the bus. We were either black or Hispanic, and we were bused out to white communities um, for school. 
And um, one of the things that they had is, you know, I played basketball, which is, you know, if you were involved in extracurricular programs, whether it be basketball, drama, music, or whatever, it meant you had to be at school after hours. Um, being that we were bused out, you know, I had an hour and a half bus drive. Um, you know, so we're up at five o'clock in the morning, and that include picking up other students throughout the city as well, but it was still an hour and a half bus drive going and an hour and a half back. So what they did is they had a program where they had a host family program. Because if you're a part of these um, activities and you had to stay after school, then you had to have somewhere to stay at night because there was no bus to bring you back to the city. So, um, you know, I, I remember having these host families and um, that's another level of building that relationship. I'm sleeping in your home, I'm sleeping in your room, I'm eating breakfast and lunch and dinner with you and your family. Um, and, you know, our parents really never met aside from maybe phone calls to stay in touch, but they never really met, you know, and I know there's teacher, parent-teacher conferences, but, you know, my single mother, you know, raising five kids, she can never make those things, so those opportunities didn't happen either, right? So I want to fast forward just to kind of get to an experience that kind of rose up some feelings um, up from the past with, you know, recent events that happened. So you know, as we got older in high school, you know, privileged community, sometimes their parents would go away and they'd have the house to themselves. And when they did that, they'd throw these big parties over the weekend. And, you know, we're all invited, right? So everyone's out there. And I remember one incident um, where one of these parties were going on and, um, you know, a situation broke out between um, a white person who lived in the community and you know, one of us that was bust out there. And the situation got kind of violent and someone got hurt that night. And um, police were called, all these things, and, and a lot of things um, happened. But what happened as a result of that is a line was drawn and you had to choose which side of that line you were gonna be on. And when you looked up, those who were white were on this side and those who were of color were on this side. Um, so immediately when something happened, we just, you know, the prejudices and the things that made us different became what was important and we chose sides, um, which is kind of like what we're seeing today, you know, well, you know, it, and that's why I say when I saw what happened with George Floyd and then you see people choosing sides, it just brought up feelings um, from the past and, um, you know, I don't want to go on too long, but one of the things that happened as a result of that is for months now, school was never the same, right? So, you know, we didn't walk to class alone and the campus was kind of spread out almost like a college campus. So sometimes you had to leave from building A to go to building F for your next class, but you would wait outside that door for someone who looked like you to walk with you to that next class to make sure everyone was safe because fights were breaking out all over the place. People were getting jumped all over the time. This went on for a while. And um, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the crazy thing about it is, you know, I was, being, I was a student athlete, I played basketball. So although this was going on, when we went to practice, basketball unified us. So there was something that brought unity, right? So there was something that we had in common that we were able to unify around. But outside of that, the, our differences were right at the forefront of everything. And it caused some broken relationships. And I, I wanna make that point because these are people that we knew since the second grade. Some even were in that program from kindergarten. So these are relationships that were brand new and then all of a sudden people are choosing sides. These were hidden prejudices that all of a sudden when things got tough, they came out. And, you know, yeah, so that, that's, that's uh, you know, what I want to share. And, and, you know, the scripture that I want to share is um, Luke 6, 42. Um, and I'm reading from the ESV. It says, how can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. 
And part of the problem that went on then and is going on today is we're telling everybody else what they have to fix, what they have to do um, in order to bring change, but we're not looking at what we have to do personally. And every last one of us are raised with prejudice. All of us are raised to see differences. So how do we so deal, how with, do we that deal with that question. is the question. Thank you. Jamal, that was awesome. Um, yeah, you know, I think that taking the speck out of your own eye, uh, to me, that's even the purpose of this conversation is just trying to get at truth, trying to understand the underlying issues. Uh, you know, just quickly, um, I, I remember I, my family used to, uh, you know, we were middle class, white family. My father's a fireman. You know, my mother stay, was a stay-at-home mom. But we had a, a bungalow that we would rent uh, in the summertime, part of a beach community. And, uh, you know, I was going there from the time I was six years old. When I was 20 years old, um, my sister and some of her friends had, like, taken a, a half share in this bungalow that we used to stay at because my, you know, my mother didn't want to rent up for the whole season. And uh, my sister had uh, invited, she was a, a registered nurse, and she had invited down some of her colleagues, and one was a, 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 a you know, an African-American nurse who she worked with, and uh, they went to the beach club, and um, we had these passes, and we had guest passes, and she gave a guest pass to her friends, as you would expect, um, but my sister wasn't aware of, I think some of us in the family knew that, listen, they're really... You know, they're very prejudiced in this, this area. And uh, if you brought down a black person, they weren't welcome. And uh, so, but we didn't talk about it. Like, we didn't just bring it up because, you know, it, it, it sort of wasn't, we weren't bringing down black people because most of our friends were white. It was just, that's how it was. And so, while I, I never felt like prejudice was like a, a big deal in my family, we had, you know, we had other, you know, Friends, my, my, I remember my, my brother, uh, my older brother had a, a black friend, and I remember one time he was going to bring him down, and my mother panicked, like, oh, no, if he comes, it's going to be an issue, and then they decided not to come. But anyway, my sister brought down this nurse. They went to the beach club. She gave him a pass. She was stopped at the gate and said, wait, where are you going? You know, and she showed the pass and said, I'm a guest of, you know, uh, Kathy White, and, uh, and they had to let her in, but after renting this bungalow for like 20 or at least 15 seasons in a row that I'm aware of, and it was always, you know, you had the right to renew, not the right, but the, you know, they would give you the opportunity to renew because you were, you know, a continual member. The next year, uh, we, they rented it to someone else. We, we, after 15 years of renting, they didn't even give us the opportunity to re rent We couldn't go back. Um, and when we talked to people we knew from down there, uh, they said that that was the reason. Uh, because we had invited, you know, my sister had invited a black nurse. So it's been around us, but I have to also confess that, listen, there's been cultural ignorance on my part, and I think um, I haven't really dealt with a lot of the underlying issues, and, you know, I've, I've come to see some of my own cultural biases. And just in this process, in these conversations, I've been trying to learn you know what are some of the uh, some of the underlying issues that have been reinforced? You know, like I said, my family we weren't outright prejudiced, but we were aware, and we were like, you know, like my mom didn't want my brother to bring his friend down because we were fine with it. We would have him to our home in Queens, but now we were in Jersey, and we were aware of the environment around us, and we're like, it might not be good for you to bring your friend Mike down because he's African American. Um, and so, like, I, I guess we're complicit, mm -hmm. you know? Like, we, we went along with what was the culture around us, and I, and I think we have to start to rise up and not be complicit anymore. Like, you may not be overtly uh, prejudiced or, or racist, but the complicity is, is, is a big problem, and we have to come to terms with it. Um, you know, I wanted to touch on, and I'm aware of the time, we only have about another five minutes. <laughs> and so we may have to go <laughs> to a part two on this message. Um, but I wanted to touch on some of the systemic things that are actually written into law, were written into law at different times. 
and it's really very recent history. And and I was never taught this in school. I, you know, we, I took American history and high school and uh, in different levels, but I never never knew some of these truths that, you know. Um, uh, in the Civil Rights Act of 1964, outlawed discrimination in housing and other areas based on race. But you know, 50 years later, look, we still have black neighborhoods and white neighborhoods. You know, and we never stop. I, I personally never stop to say, why is that? Why why are we so segregated? Not realizing that there there's actually underlying issues that are the reason for the segregation. Uh, after World War II, the, you know, the federal government embarked on a program to move middle-class white families into the suburbs. So suburbs like just east of New York here in, in Levittown is a giant suburb. It was developed by William Levitt. He built about 1,700 homes. In order to be able to build those homes, Levitt needed to get a federally-backed loan. Like the banks weren't going to lend him this money to build these homes unless the federal government stood behind him. So as part of the GI Bill, the Federal Home Loan Administration, you know, agreed to, to lend William Levitt uh, money to build these homes. But Levitt had to make a commitment to the Federal Home Loan Association never to sell a home to an African American. Now, Levitt, from you read a little bit of history about him, he was a bigot. He had no problem making that commitment. He had no intention of selling to African Americans anyway. But they actually put clauses in the deed saying to prevent sales or even rentals to African Americans. Otherwise, you couldn't get a, the bank loan. And so this, this went on and actually and remained in some of these, these deeds until like, like 1968 68 when they passed when they the Fair Housing Act. And the Fair Housing Act in 1968, not that long ago, uh, allowed African Americans to move into towns like Levittown. But what happened during that period? Also, the federal government started to back loans, like uh, to middle class white Americans. You could get a mortgage. So you could get a mortgage to buy a house and have a payment scheduled out over 25 to 30 years. But guess what? The Federal Home Loan Association wouldn't back loans to African Americans. They were like specifically excluded. So when you think about how many uh, middle-class white Americans sort of built wealth in America, often it's, it was based on home ownership. So they bought houses for maybe $8,000 in Levittown. So 30 years later, those houses are worth $150,000, $250,000, and they have a nice little nest egg. But this opportunity to returning Veterans of World War II who were African-American, they were excluded by law from these programs. I was never taught that in high school. I question out on Zoom, how many of you were taught this? Did you know this? Like some of you may have come to the, the knowledge of this, but um, I, 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 was, I was ignorant of it. And so I'm just trying, I'm starting to educate myself on, on some of these things. I want you guys to feel free if you want to interject at any time, just, you know. Um, the New Deal in 1933, that's what allowed mortgages to uh, for 25 or 30 years, but I, I, as I just sent. They actually, where the term redlining comes from is the Federal Home Loan Association drew lines around communities and said you can't make loans in these communities. Uh, they were economically depressed, also disproportionately black neighborhoods. So they were, that's how they were excluded. And that's where the term redlining comes from. The federal government drew the red lines and said you can't make mortgage loans in these areas. But go ahead, Yana. Oh, yeah, I just, I just wanted to add that. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Okay, cool. Um, Hold it close. Yeah, yeah. so um, redlining continued into the 21st century. Wells Fargo had a huge settlement with the federal government over this uh, in, in Baltimore. Yeah, can you hear me now? Good. Okay. Not just here, but out in the in Yeah. Yeah, that that was only several years ago. Yeah. So like this is not just historic things. It's 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 still perpetuating right now, even to the extent that you know I, I was um helping my mother in law um uh try to find a rental and I myself um was uh 
and, and she was getting discrimination and she was not being afforded the opportunity to rent in certain neighborhoods. And this was in New Jersey. So this is not like a Southern thing or Midwestern thing. It happens even in our own communities here. Yeah. You know, and, and it, it can be very subtle. Um, you know, you may be aware you're renting a house, um, you know, you're white, you're renting a house in a white neighborhood, and you may be okay, you know, having a, an African-American neighbor, but you may say to yourself, if I rent to them, you know, what's going to be the reaction of my neighbors? And you may hesitate to, to, to even rent. I know that's happened uh, on and on. And um, actually, can I say one? Yes. I'd like to say one thing just on that. Um, uh, so this is one uh, situation that my mother-in-law, uh, she found an apartment that she wanted to, uh, she wanted to rent. And the, the, the landlord actually told her this. I would like to rent to somebody who I feel like could be my friend, who can hang out with me, and then denied her the rental. This is several years ago. Yeah. And, and that's, against the, that's against the law in 1968. You're, you're not allowed to do that. But it still, it still uh, perpetuates. Yeah, you know, I was, um, um, yeah, yeah, praise, praise. So I, I, I just, I wanted to touch on um, just as the church, just just how can we respond um, during this time and and even talk about some practical things um, that we can do. Um, I know when everything broke out, um, you know, I had to process a lot of emotions that rose up in me. Um, but I also felt like through prayer um, that I was led to pause, you know, listen before I speak and react to what was going on. And, um, you know, I want to share in Ephesians 4, verses 2 to 3, the ESV um, verse, uh, translation. Again, it says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And, you know, I love this scripture. And I think as the church, because even today, and, and, you know, Pastor Bill alluded to it, we still have the black church. We still have the white church. But what we all have is the Holy Spirit. And this says the Holy Spirit is the spirit of unity and the bond of peace. And as we approach this, this and look for solutions moving forward, we have to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Because if we're not, then we have to ask ourselves, well, what is influencing our decisions moving forward? And that's going to affect the conversations that we have. And, and, and just a couple of things that I really think as the church we need to do, and rather than worrying about what's going on outside, number one, we, we need to educate ourselves. And that's all of us because none of us have been taught this stuff. So we, we have to go back and deliberately educate ourselves. Um, number two, I, I think we need to deal with the prejudices in our own heart. Ask the Lord to reveal them to us and, and, and work through them because we all have them. And, and I think number three, um, there's going to be... We, we have to have the, the kitchen table conversations, um, not only with our, you know, and I'm not talking about invite someone who doesn't look like you to your kitchen table. We got to start at home first um, with our families, you know, and we have to have these difficult conversations. If you have parents that have a problem with you bringing someone home that doesn't look like you, that's a conversation you need to have. You have to have it because these things are no longer acceptable. Amen, amen. Um, I'm conscious of the time, so I want to kind of bring this, this to uh, not a conclusion, because I, I don't think we've concluded anything. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I want to say, because <laughs> this has to be a, a continued conversation, you know, and it, it, uh, there has to be an awareness I think the biggest thing, and, and Jamal, I think you said it, the, my biggest call to action is let's get educated. Let's find out the facts, like what's happened. You know, there's a lot of variables and, and differences and whatever, but, you know, let's not just be informed by our cultural biases. Let's be informed by some of the facts on, on the ground, objective things like, 
you know, we can look at these deeds and these laws and different things and say, like, this actually happened. What was the remedy? You know, it, you know, the Bible says, you know, where there's sin, we need to repent. And if, if you've done wrong, you know, if you've stolen, <laughs> return. And so, you know, it, th these things need to be addressed and not run away from. And um, we need to start to hold Genesis 126, that man is created in the image of God. Every tribe, every tongue, every ethnos, all over the world, we're image bearers. Each of us are image bearers of God, and we have to see God in each of us. Our failure to look at our brothers and sisters that have a different complexion, come from a different part of the world, uh, have different features or speak a different language, uh, our failure to see God in them is one of the biggest failures of our of the body of Christ. God is giving us room to repent. He's giving us space to get this right. Life Center, I love you guys. Thanks for being with us today. We're going to break out into some discussion rooms, I understand right now. Uh, in those discussion rooms, you can ask for prayer. And uh, yeah, love you guys. We'll, 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 we'll see you soon. shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace.